I'm Nina Prater. And I'm Jeremy Prater. Um, welcome to the farm. Uh, this is Winsett Ranch. Uh, we've had this farm as a family for the past 60 plus years. So uh, the farm is about 230 acres. Um, approximately two thirds of that is in forest. Uh, we have a diversified livestock farm here. So we have a cow-calf operation, meat goats, and a few dairy goats, uh, some stray chickens, laying hens, and one peacock. <laughs> We've had a farm here as a family for so long, there's been any number of latitudes or risk financially for the place. Of course, starting out, the grandparents were uh, having to make a note on the, you know, pay, make the payments for the land. Um, that was always a risk. Any kind of livestock is a walk-in risk and hazard out here. Um, when Nina and I became more involved in the farm about 12 years ago now, um, we introduced our own flavor of risk with uh, doing pasture poultry, forested hogs, um, Meat goats were um, we we put on the place, and so those all those operations kind of were inherently risky. And I pulled a pretty significant loan to do some of that. Um, so those were operations that um, you know looked pretty successful on paper. Um, we got a loan, which made them riskier, um, and uh, that sort of thing. Things that are outside of our control are include things like hay prices and you know there's the cattle market that can go up and down so those are sort of the risks that we uh, manage um, but it's much less risky than um, than you know the chicken and the pork that relied on a lot of a uh, lot of grain inputs before we could get our money back selling the selling the meat so. Mm -hmm. So we like this level of risk. <laughs> yeah. I would say our number one risk um, currently is with wild dogs. We have a pretty healthy wild dog population. The livestock guardian dogs that we use um, are uh, really, really effective at, at keeping that problem down. Uh, this year was a pretty good uh, army worm outbreak, um, and that's a good predator for forage. We managed to get through that one pretty well this year. Um, but that's always a concern. We're always out at the right times of the year to check for armory worms. We're doing samples on the, on the pastures to, to manage for that risk as well. Farming is one of the most dangerous professions, so we have to make sure that on, we as farmers are safe. Um, but there's all different ways you can get hurt yourself on a farm. Um, from, you know, using the tractor inappropriately and rolling it over, so you put bar, roll up, roll over bar on. Um, any number of things like that. Just even driving um, along the edge of the pastures where the trees are, I'm always checking the canopy for uh, limbs that may be ready to come down, that sort of thing. Farmer mental health mm. is a really important aspect of uh, making sure we as humans are, are doing okay. It's a, you know, the mental health strain of farming can be really tough sometimes, and so I think it's really important to to say that out loud because it's not something people like to talk about. So um, one uh, way that we like to uh, mitigate production risk is by starting with healthy soil. So if you've got a healthy soil, if you really focus on building up your soil health over time, it'll make your pastures, in our case, resilient to weather extremes. So if there's a huge rainfall event, it will infiltrate that soil, that, that rain into the soil rather than causing a catastrophic erosion event, which happens if your soil is, isn't healthy or is exposed. Um, and then if there's a drought, it can hold water longer through the drought and then recover from that drought when you finally get rain faster. So it's a way to sort of um, limit the, the highs and lows of, of the weather extremes and, and make your production more even over time. Um, you know, we do field days on the farm, so we've got um, a whole farm liability insurance uh, that we've always carried. Um, you know, we like to have the uh, school groups come up and see the farm, that sort of thing. Um, and you've got to just, you have to cover that base of if you're doing hay rides like we're sitting on today, if somebody falls off the back of the trailer and gets a knock on the head, you, you need to be responsible. For, you're responsible, you're legally responsible for the health and well-being of that person. Quite a lot of the farm is uh, forested. And there's parts of the perimeter fence that we don't check on a daily basis. It might be two or three years before I particularly walk that section of fence out. And lo and behold, uh, not too long ago, um, a few extra deer stands showed up across on our property line. 
Up until the minute I saw those deer stands, my understanding, please don't take this for legal advice, but my understanding was, had I not seen those um, deer stands, I'm not liable for anything that happened over there. But now that I know they're there, legally, I need to go talk to that landowner, and we not need to, landowner. or no, I'm sorry, not that landowner, oh, sure. that um, <laughs> trespasser, that trespasser and I have to have a conversation because I'm liable for that person's health and well-being because they're on my property. Uh, we have the insurance to cover, you know, if people come on the farm and happen to get injured, you know, that kind of insurance, but not like if something happened to, like if there was a lightning strike and it killed a bunch of cows, we're out of luck. We had a windstorm come through and kill almost 500, almost there completely was... raised mm -hmm. uh, birds, and we were in a hole. We were in debt immediately. And from that minute on, we were behind the eight ball on cash flow and making payments on things, and it it pretty well um, could have put us out of business. I mean, it was within Nina having a great job and not kind of a distance between putting us in. To, uh, Yep. And if we'd had insurance, it would have just been a minor hiccup, but it was a major... It was a major problem. It was a major... We, uh, <laughs> that, that, you know, a moment like that and you're upside down on your cash flow all of a sudden, um, you know, like whatever you thought was going to be profit or cash flow from the last, you know, income stream is now just paying off a debt you've incurred by not having that production. So we don't have it. I definitely see the value in it. Um, but we don't have anything like a crop insurance that a row cropper might have. Um, we've read a little tiny bit about whole farm revenue protection insurance, um, but haven't figured out if it would if it would work for us. If if there is a policy that would cover our type of operation and our scale of operation. Um, advice for a, a new farmer: grow slow, don't owe, and watch your cash flow. That's what I would say to a, a brand new for a catchphrase and to learn everything you can about soil health, to build that soil's health to last for generations. Uh, so that was a, uh, a short, uh, yet normally we have them a little longer, but like I said, we had a, Jeremy and Nina had such a wealth of information that we wanted to share about them and their farms. Uh, so do, do anyone have any questions? Uh, and if not, I'll let Jeremy uh, get started with some information, but if anyone have any questions, okay. Yes, yeah, I had a question. Um, I'm dialing in for Pennsylvania. Okay. So the last three little tips they had for beginning farmers, I heard grow slow something and watch your cash flow. What was the middle item? Don't owe. Don't owe. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. No debt. Yep. As best you can. Yep. All right. All right. Any more questions from the from the video? All right. Well, Jeremy, um, could you just share with us some information? Even though we're going to be talking about risk management. Just, just share with us some of the risk uh, that you can think of. I know some, some of the people probably just coming into the room um, and uh, uh, they probably missed part of the video, but what the video was designed to do was to, to see the hands on on the farm because uh, normally we would have had this in person on your farm as a workshop, but uh, uh, due to uh, COVID restraints at the time we did the filming, we weren't allowed to to actually uh, have in-person workshops uh, from our organization. So uh, could you share uh, some information about risk that, that, that happened on your farm that, that you feel comfortable yeah. sharing? Sure, absolutely. Um, first of all, thanks for having me on today. Um, and thanks for making me look a lot smarter than I normally look uh, on your video. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, a lot of our risk, um, we've got a, you know, it's a livestock farm, you know, we're far away from town. so. Uh, there's any number of uh, risks that we're managing for. Um, you know, we can't eliminate risks generally, but we can manage for them. So that's one of the things we're kind of doing a lot of preventative maintenance, I guess is a good way to look at it. Um, sorry, I've got dogs that are starting to come visit and tell me about their day. Um, anyhow, the, you know, weather's always going to be a, an issue that we're looking at. Um, you know, so you're like any other farmer of any type, you're worried about the weather and how to manage for, a sudden snap and changing conditions today it looks like we're going to go from sunny and warm to uh cold and rainy here in an hour or so um 
so we're worried about you know generally speaking whether um and on a livestock operation that that's going to entail like what types of shelter and water and you know kind of feed situation we're looking at um we have a grass-based farm so we're always looking at production of that grass so all of our livestock are, are grass-fed um and then now we're worried about soil health so we're managing for that which means that we're uh, also checking pastures for any kind of uh, army worms which are mentioned in the in the video um, so a lot of it's monitoring and thinking into the future as best you can and then managing risk. So environmental factors, that's one type of risk. Um, we've got uh, all, all sorts of equipment that needs to be A, maintained, um, B, the folks that are running that equipment, you know, it's family farm. So all of us uh, in the family have access to these tools, but being really um, able to be competent with that equipment before you hop on it and go try to do a big project. Um, you know, right now we're working on various uh, sections of forest, um, either to open up new pasture or to thin it out to make it healthier. You know, and that's a that's a logging operation, and you know it, it can bring its own hazards in. So you're all the time, you know, you need to have competent training before you get into that kind of stuff. I was lucky um, in a past career. I worked in the National um, Park Service, and I was trained through that with uh, a lot of loggers. So I had a lot of that kind of training coming into. Uh, my full-time farming career um but that's that's sort of uh you know projects you take on bring on risk um you know we mentioned sorry there's a big uh bomber going overhead um there's a uh financial risk uh, we try to be really conservative with our financial risks um things are uh uh you know prices on cattle that's our primary income stream we do have our goats Sorry if the airplanes are getting into the audio here. Um, so those prices can fluctuate. We've been lucky the last couple of years, they've been relatively steady, but you're always uh, uh, thinking, you know, what, what do I do if those prices, do we need to change, you know, what class of livestock are we selling um, just to manage that? Also, um, you know, because of that um, potential fluctuation, we really have gotten adverse to taking on any extra debt that's not necessary. Um, you know, we tend to, you know, run a truck or a tractor into the dirt before, um, you know, I haven't done all the maintenance, but, you know, 300,000 miles on a truck is not unusual for us, um, simply because we're, we're not looking to take on that debt until the maintenance require, you know, the, when the maintenance cost outweighs your, your payment on your, on a new truck, that's when we make the switch. Um, you know, for example, we just, after 24 years, um, upgraded to a new tractor but we ran that other tractor to the point where it was catching fire on a regular basis before we jumped into the, the debt payment. And even that was, you know, pull out the spreadsheet, schedule it out. You know, how do we make the cash flow to make those payments and insurance and all that business? So there's, while we're not, um, you know, we're not a row crop farm and we're not doing, uh, we don't get crop insurance. All of the same principles apply um, with, uh, you know, somebody that's doing crops or livestock. You're always looking at, managing environmental factors, your human factors, and then whatever kind of debt burden you're taking on. And, you know, in the past, we've tried lots of different things and some have worked and some have, you know, crashed into a big ball of flames. And um, what's allowed us to keep going was even when, so when one operation crashes and burns, it's not so critical to the overall operation of the farm that we can set a given project to the side and say, okay, we're willing to risk X, Y, Z amount of time, effort, and money on this potential uh, project or potential profits, um, but it's not gonna, even if it fails, it's not gonna jeopardize the whole rest of the operation. So the intention is to have, uh, you know, I'm the third generation on the farm raising the fourth, and we're hoping that, you know, my kids will be sitting here saying that they're the fourth generation, you know, raising the fifth and sixth generation on the farm. So in a nutshell, that's kind of where we're going with uh, how we manage things. Um, I should probably stop and let you direct me or have more questions yeah does, does anyone have any questions well, is everything clear to everyone because we, we want to make sure we touch bases even if if uh, like uh i know Jer jeremy your farm is diversified right so is there any time that the the that the cattle prices are at a low and the, and the uh gold prices are at a high so yeah so yeah, that's that's one of the reasons we kind of um, we started doing different operations. Currently today, things are 
quite a lot simpler than they were in the past. Um, so today the cattle prices say they may come down a bit, um, but our uh, goat prices have actually increased over time. There's more and more demand for uh, goats either as, uh, you know, you have smaller um, like homestead type uh, places like 10 acres or less. And those folks tend to like goats because they're easier to manage. So that, that allows me as a, um, a breeder to increase that market. Um, <clears throat> also, there's, um, you know, just, again, more demand for that type of meat. Um, the, uh, so that does help offset things. When we were doing a lot of uh, forested pork, um, pasture poultry, and those sorts of things, the prices on those, when I was direct marketing, were great. Um, the, the downside was is if that market, that market to service that market as a, you know, to do your sales and PR, that costs quite a bit of money. So you had to offset it a bit. But once um, we had to get out of those markets and go to, uh, they were high risk in that there wasn't a sale barn type uh, marketplace for those animals that give you a good price. So for example, on hogs, when I was direct marketing those, I could get on a, on a finished hog, um, the cash coming into the farm um, to pay bills with would be about $500 a head. Well, when I had to liquidate those animals and take them to a sale barn, I got $25 a head. Um, so that makes those animals quite risky. On the cattle, um, this isn't our primary way of selling cattle, but we finished a few steers every year um, to sell locally as uh, you know USDA inspected beef. Um, that's a premium market for us. And so we get paid really well when we do that. But if for some reason, like those customers go away or, you know, we have a production issue and I need to take animals to the sale barn, we build our business off of that sale barn price, not the higher retail price. Um, and so that allows uh, us to manage some of that risk, too. But, yeah, having a few things going on is always going to help. So currently there's a market, a big demand here locally for um, timber, for cedar it logs in particular. And we've got quite a lot of that on the place that needs to be thinned out anyhow. So that's become, in the last two years, another revenue stream. It's a, a job I can do when uh, things are slow otherwise on the farm. So having slightly different um, uh, income streams, um, you may have your base model. For us, that's the cattle that we had on the goats, maybe a little bit of uh, forestry. Um, we're slowly planting an orchard, so that'll be something else that we might have down you know, in 10 years. That'll be another stream. All right, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna skip uh, from uh, uh, Jeremy. We're gonna go to Jeff and let him talk a little bit about how his farm, your farm, relates to what he does. And uh, believe me, Jeff has done his homework. He is very good at this. Everybody, let me introduce to you Jeff Shazinski. All right, take it away, Jeff. All right, hello, everyone. Hear me? I hope so. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I, I appreciate the, the discussion of risk other than in crop insurance, um, because I spend too much time with that and less with all the other ways to mitigate risks in farming and ranching. Okay, we're good to go then. Well, welcome, my name is Jeff Shazinski and I'm, I'm glad to be here today. Um, I'm in Montana and my wife asked me this morning, she says, do they call Places, places that graze livestock ranches in Arkansas, or do they call them something else? Because <laughs> how do you in Montana, a ranch, you know, is, is well known and is usually extensive and it's thousands and thousands of acres. But I'm glad to hear that Jeremy referred to his place as a ranch because I like, I like that term or integrated livestock operation, other ways to do that. And as Jeremy told you, only there's many ways to mitigate risk in the risky business of, of farming and ranching. And insurance is only one way to mitigate risk. And, and, and uh, Jeremy did a great job of explaining some other ways to mitigate risk. Um, you know, hedging, there's, there's, there's multiple ways. Uh, and it's important to note before I begin that really the, the certainly the majority of farms and certainly the majority of ranches, people that are just livestock operations, do not have uh, insurance for the, for the products they grow. Now they can, and that's what we're going to learn here about a little bit today, at least there's some potential to, but um, in generally speaking, it's, it's not um, in terms of numbers, not in terms of value necessarily, but in terms of numbers, 
Uh, a, lot of, a lot of farms don't, farms and ranches do not have crop insurance. There's some jargon and with all, with all um, knowledge, there's always a jargon that gets, and I tend having done this about, I think on my 19th year of talking about crop insurance, um, you know, I tend to use these words as if they're just a second language and many people don't really uh, know them uh, that haven't been <laughs> spending as much time as I have. Um, revenue risk, and this is probably the one that I'll, I use a lot because I'm talking about a revenue product. And, and that really includes two types of, of, of financial monetary risks. The, the risks associated with yield, which is kind of obvious for folks. I mean, that's what most people think of in crop insurance. They think when the flood hits or when the drought comes, and that's what they often call, uh, uh, it's often the insurance term they call multiple perils, the multiple, the various perils that it can affect a farm or ranch. And that's another word for multiple peril, which is really talking about yield insurance. So the yield of the product you're growing is affected by the weather or some other cause of loss. But there's also another cause of loss, and that's the price of the product, because you might begin growing a crop at the beginning of the year. And by the time you're done spending all your money, the price has crashed and um, you, you had to uh, put and deal with that risk of price changes might add also that input prices change too. And there's, there is an insurance now that it's only available for very few amount of crops called margin insurance, which is actually based on the margin between your expenses income. I don't know that product very well, it's very new, but, but you can see it's adding in another risk, the risk that your input prices change uh, over time. Uh, but yield risk is the one I think most people are familiar with. The Risk Management Agency is the federal agency. It's overseen by the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation, but it's the agency that manages the federal crop insurance program. And that's the program programs and policies that I'll be talking about today. Uh, crop insurance is a private industry too, and we'll get to that. But there, so there are other private pro policies that are very specific, but I'm talking about the federal and the federal subsidized programs today. Uh, and these are and these pro and these policies, these programs, are and plans are provided um, by what was called approved insurance providers or AIPs. And really, there are only 13 companies nationwide that service all the federal crop insurance program. So it's a it's a very fairly narrow group of, of folks, uh, of companies, and then liability. I think most people know this too from their cars and houses is the value of what is insured. So, so, uh, and it's never a hundred percent. So if I got a car and it's a hundred thousand dollars, I can take, I can get some coverage of that hundred thousand dollars, let's say 85,000. And that's my liability. That's the coverage that I cover. The indemnity is the value of the payout. And just say what you get paid for your loss, your loss payment is another way to say that. And the premium is, of course, the cost of the insurance, which in federal crop insurance is highly subsidized. Here's a kind of a schematic of the federal crop insurance. And it's a very strange world because it's, it's both private and public at the same time. Some people <laughs> joked and said, we got the worst of both worlds <laughs> in crop insurance. <laughs> we have the federal government and a private company working together, but it does work that way. And it was set up that way in 1980. Um, by a peanut farmer from Georgia by the name of Jim, Jimmy Carter. But anyway, um, and the idea is, is that the private insurance are, get paid by the, by the government to essentially service these projects to farmers. And these AIPs, these uh, approved insurance providers have agents that work for them all over the country in every county, a lot of counties and every, you know, anyway, they're spread out over the country and they service uh, these products. And the producers pay a part of the premium to the company directly, and then part of it goes to federal crop insurance. The federal government pays some of the cost of those by subsidizing them. And then the private insurance company in between are getting what they call a, a gain. And I'll, I'll show you this. So this is gives you, a, it's kind of a, a little bit strange uh, doc, um, graph here, but if you think about it every year, 
all over the entire country, there's going to be a certain amount of losses and a certain amount of gains. In other words, some people are going to have losses and they're going to get claims, they're going to get paid out. Other people are going to pay into the program, but they're not going to receive any payment because nothing happened. You know, the house didn't burn down, the crops didn't get destroyed. So they didn't receive a payment. That's a good thing. But of course, you had to pay, pay the risk, but, but sometimes the government takes in more than it gives out. And when it takes in more than it gives out, that's called a, that's a gain year. And, and to basically incentivize the private companies for providing this product, they essentially give what's called an underwriting gain. And these dark blue uh, things are the gains that were provided to the public, I mean, the private companies that service the product. So you can see, and the reason I put this up here is one, you can see that many years in 2012, I don't know if people were around farming, but it was one of the worst crop insurance, livestock insurance disaster years in the, in the last few years. And you can see that there actually was a negative gain. That means that we actually had to bail out some of the private companies because it was so bad and there were so many claims up to almost $14 billion worth of losses in that one year alone. But you can see that's not the typical case. And in fact, if you look as of late, there's been quite a bit of gain. The point being that your crop agent and the insurance company, you know, they're getting paid well for servicing these products, so they should service you well. It's really the, the most important point I wanted to make there. Um, we're going to be talking about livestock today, and it was actually interesting for me to do this because I don't usually deal as much with livestock, and neither does the federal crop insurance program, just by its name. It's not called the Federal Crop and Livestock Program. It's called the Federal Crop Insurance Program, even though there are some products available under the Federal Crop Insurance Program that also include livestock. But they aren't as, they've been slow in coming. They aren't as um, significant as they are for crops. And um, these are some of the ones that are available there. It's called Livestock Risk Protection and it works for swine fed cattle and feeders and and it's available nationally but in um arkansas you can see that it wasn't um it wasn't used highly um and that's kind of typical they're not particularly great programs and i'm not going to discuss them today um because that's one that i don't and i know kind of how they work but not that well the other one is a fairly new program called dairy revenue and there were 5,000 uh, of these policies written nationwide last year. Uh, this, I mean, this this year and this, this crop year and um, none were sold in Arkansas. I don't know that's maybe there's not that many dairies and maybe they didn't need or think that the insurance would work for them. And they're mostly about a declining in market price um, issue. So they're, they provide that kind of price decline protection. But again, I'm not going to spend too much time. I just wanted to put this out there because um, we are going to be talking about a livestock example today. Um, there is also a farm service agency program, which I do not know that much about either. And I looked up for this for this presentation, but it's called the, the Livestock Indemnity Program. I couldn't find, it was created in 2018. Um, it has to do with <laughs> deaths in excess of normal mortality caused by eligible conditions. It's a bit, um, including, you know, like a giant freeze or some, it's more like a disaster program. And um, I have not, um, I don't know the details. I don't know how well it works. I could not find out if anyone in Arkansas accessed this. It's not a, exactly a technically, it's more like a disaster thing and it's not really so much um, again, a program that is insurance per se, but it is a, an available program and um, you can look into it if you are experienced um, a severe uh, depredation, which we did here in Montana this year, actually, in terms of, and there were even some special, special disaster programs that came out because of the drought we had here in Montana this year. Um, but here's the use of crop insurance slash livestock insurance. In, and in 2021 in Arkansas. And as typical nationwide, there are soybeans, rice, cotton, wheat, these five crops nationwide are the preponderant uh, uh, 
insurance garnered by farmers that grow those crops in the United States. And you can see the liability, again, the value of what is insured is, is significant. And, uh, and, you, and you can see that if you go down even to this uh, pasture range road, I'll just talk about meat and immediately, you're seeing that you're not, um, you know, most of them are, most of the, most of the ener energy and, and thing is going out to these crops, these individual crops. Um, whole farm revenue, which I will talk about, is, is fairly high uh, in terms of uh, use in Arkansas. Uh, so that doesn't represent a lot of policies because as I will talk about later, whole farm revenue is protecting the revenue of the whole farm. So you're protecting the whole value, not of any one specific crop or livestock product. Uh, fresh markets, tomatoes, um, bees um, is really about the similar is, is basically it's part of this program, which I'll explain um, is a, it's a, a very unique uh, policy and it's fairly significant in Montana. I thought it was interesting grapes. There is one policy <laughs> for yield protection for grapes and that represents $780 worth of grapes were insured in Arkansas this year. I hope they did well. Um, the other, the one that again that is kind of unique, and I won't again, I won't spend, I can't do all spend a time on all of these per se, but this is becoming a more and more valuable and well used, um, more used program in the United States. It's called pasture range land and forage, and it's a very unusual kind of insurance, um, and it's based on a rainfall index, and it's livestock related because obviously livestock as Jeremy showed it, you know, live on pasture. And if you have really dry weather on a drought, your pasture quality can degrade significant, particularly if you don't have irrigation. And therefore you, that's a risk of loss of forage or pasture or rangeland if you're out here in the West, which is extensive. And these are grids, 17 miles by 17 miles. And you get in that grid and it's an index, meaning that it's based on data really collected by meteorological data. And if in that seven, and if you take out a policy during a certain month and the rainfall falls before be below a certain predetermined level, you will receive an indemnity, a payout, regardless of whether you actually had loss. It just clicks automatically based on the index that rep is represented in that 17 mile grid. Now, Jeremy's place is probably less than 70 mile, but he'll be in a specific 17 mile grid. And if the forage in that area, even if it, part of it might, might his ranch might not be in there, if it in that 70 mile grid, again, it hits a critical limit, you get paid automatically. You don't even have to, you don't even have to address, well, I had these risks. You don't have to quantify the risk. It just gets paid based on that. It's a bit tricky to choose uh, how to do this, uh, how to, to, to apply and it's complicated to apply for. You have to choose dates and times and and, your, and identify your grid. But again, talk to your crop insurance agent. And it is being used in Arkansas. And, uh, and again, it's uh, related to drought. This also includes bees and honeys. Uh, and it has to do the same thing. The idea is that the rain affects the forage of the bees that produce honey. Therefore, if it hits a certain indicator in your 17 mile, your bees are placed there you'll get a payment for that. This has become a, a highly used product, particularly in the Southwest over the last two years. And, and though it says it's not really supposed to be about droughts, obviously if in any beginning of the year, you don't know there's gonna be a drought next year. So you really can keep taking it out even as drought proceeds. Um, and unfortunately, I think it's been used and it's going to continue to be used because particularly in the Southwest of Montana where I am, we've been having several years, not so much back to back, but alternating layers of drought. So this is a livestock product that is out there, pro product that again, not directly insures the cows or the, or the goats, but it, uh, or, the, or the lambs, but it, but it does work that way. Now I'm gonna talk about whole farm revenue. And one of the best things about whole farm revenue is that it covers the livestock, one of the, and crops, crops and livestock simultaneously because the essential element of this is that you are ensuring the revenue capacity of the farm, not any specific crop or livestock product you grow. So it kind of works like this, if you think about it. Uh, it says, farmer, rancher, you decide the mix 
of products you want to produce. Um, based on the history of your, produce, your capacity to produce, we will estimate your productive, your revenue productive capacity. How much revenue can your farm, whole farm generate? And we will ensure a part of that whole farm's revenue. And it's the only insurance policy um, in the United States that's available in every single county of the United States, Hawaii and Alaska. I didn't, couldn't put them all on the same map, but Hawaii and Alaska too actually get advantage of this. Uh, whole farm was predated by a policy called adjusted gross revenue and adjusted gross revenue light, very similar product. So it's actually a much longer, but in the 2014 farm bill, it was created and renamed and, and rejiggered into what's now known as whole farm revenue protection. And this gives you some of the most recent data on it in terms of the number of policies, which aren't huge. And you can see that they, they went up. Um, this is actually, you see 2006, that, that's the AGR, and like just a, which, which is just another name. It was really whole farm too. And that's what, how it was sold before. And then when the farm bill came, you see we had an immediate interest in it. And unfortunately, we're seeing a fairly significant de decline. And 2021 is actually lower down here too. So we've seen this de decline. And there's reasons for that, which I'll get into. Um, this is, again, covers multiple crops and livestock products. And you can see the average. It's interesting that it's not much more than, you know, the maximum, you know, average amount of different crops covered under the policy were four. But again, it's, um, it was only four, but I've seen policies and done research that have seen policies that sometimes insured up to, I think the highest I ever saw was like 62 different products uh, in a farm. And, um, and you can see that by the different kinds of products that are different crops insured, different varieties across the entire country, even with only these small amounts of policies. So these, these are this insurance, these are for relatively diverse farms. They're farms that, um, you know, that, that are significant amount of value because it's the whole values of the farm. So it, it's been used, but it's not, um, you know, in terms of number of policies, it's not a huge amount of policies sold. The basics, again, it ensures the estimate of the expected economic capacity of the farm to produce revenue. Again, it's gross revenue. We're not doing net revenue. Although I've heard somebody propose the idea that we should do a net farm, whole farm revenue policy, which then would incorporate the risk of inputs, but we won't go there right now. That's just an idea. Uh, to be eligible, farmers need to be operating at least three years. If you're a beginning farmer and a beginning farmer is 10 years or less. So otherwise it's five years and the veterans also get an advantage of being uh, three years or less. And so, so it's, you know, it's not for the, the beginning, beginning farmer. In other words, you have to establish the economic capacity of the farm to generate a revenue so we can, so they can base, a, you know, an expected revenue on what to cover. And so until you can gather that data up in a sense, you can't get a policy. I mean, that's why you have to, you know, why it's for a farmer that's been farming at least five years, because you need that record to establish the capacity of farms to generate revenue. Um, it really covers almost any product. I think the only thing is like show dogs, you know, or pet chameleons or something like that. And you can't, you know, <laughs> there's limits, but really almost every kind of crop can be insured or, or livestock product. Um, and in, if it isn't on the list when you're going to do it, you can always insure it as an other livestock or an other crop. And I have seen incredibly diversity, diverse types of lavender and all kinds of different things being insured. Because again, it's not so much what you're insuring, but the capacity of that product to generate revenue that's critical to this, which is a thing that people can't get straight, even RMA and agents who have been selling it, it's about the revenue. It's not about what you're growing so much. And it's really not for, for only for small and diverse farms, although many of them I do that are do using, I, I would say many that are, they're not the super diverse farms. They're, they're about anywhere from, you know, four or five to you know, maybe 10, 12 products uh, are the ten, tend to be the general range of what people use it. It does have a dollar value that's quite high. Um, and unfortunately, if you're just doing livestock, which I will do today, there is a limit, a much lower limit for livestock. And interestingly, last year, 
So for some reason, probably something to do with politics, I don't know, aquaculture can go to the higher level, but other livestock products can't. I'm not sure why they did that, but you have a $2 million gross revenue, which may or may not limit, uh, you know, it certainly limits uh, the larger ranches that have more than $2 million gross revenue to, to using whole farm revenue. Uh, but it's not used for the diverse cropping farm either. We have 10,000 acre uh, highly diverse uh, organic grain farms in Montana using whole farm revenue. I help many of them establish those policies too, and they may regret it. But anyway, and indemnity payment won't be made until taxes are filed for the insurance year. That's a really important point and one of its disadvantages because the way it works is that you use your tax records, your Schedule F, as the basis for establishing the revenue capacity of the farm. And that can be controversial in itself, but that's the basis of it. So you use that historic, and we'll run through an example so you can see how that works. But you use that historical basis for the capacity, economic capacity generation of the farm. However, so something happens, either yield or revenue loss, price loss, risk, you know, the revenue risk, you have a have a loss, you make a claim, you can't get the claim adjudicated or paid out until you have filed your taxes. So you have to wait for your file taxes to be filed. You made the claim, the adjustment's done, the taxes are filed, all the data is in, and then a payment is made because the, the actual filing of the taxes is the data needed in part to make the claim. So that is a bit of a time to wait. You might have had a loss and then you had to file your taxes and you got to wait. So, you know, it, it is a disadvantage because with individual crop insurance, you get paid pretty much close to the time and as soon as they can adjust and make the claim. So you get paid quicker. So that's one of its disadvantages. Um, but it also does something that no other crop insurance policy does because it's so unique in, in that the more different things you grow, the lower the cost of the premium. And that kind of makes sense if you think about it because you, you, it incentivizes the, the risk diversity, the de decline in risk that comes out of diversifying. Um, and if you grow organic things or you've been growing organic things the last five or three years, if you're a beginning farmer, and that value that you've gotten from, from growing organically is embedded in your revenue. Therefore, since it's based on your historic level, it's in a sense, the organic value is already embedded. You don't have to deal with you know, establishing prices and stuff like that you do for an individual policy because it's already embedded in your revenue and therefore in your taxes and in the, in the, in the sales that you've had. It, it only covers the value of the raw product. That is another kind of problem with this program to the degree that the person taking out the policy does value added um, items. So basically, um, if you grow strawberries, it's only going to provide revenue. It's going to be based your capacity to grow on the raw product of the strawberries. And then you take those strawberries and you make them on the farm into jam and you go and sell them at the farmer's market as jam. The value added has to be subtracted in terms of the revenue guarantee that will be insured because it only is insuring for the actual raw product value, they say to the field. And then everything past the field where you add value has to be subtracted out. To the degree that you do value added products, this this is not does not make it impossible to use this this policy, but it makes it more difficult because your your agent and you have to work backwards to basically extract that value so that you can come up with a revenue guarantee on the actual raw product. And that can be depending on how many if you do a lot of value added products that can be more complicated and take more time to, to do. Uh, the premium subsidy um, and coverage improves with three or more products. You can actually insure with one product provided it's not potatoes or not covered by another policy, but, um, and why the potatoes is so other thing. But basically after three, you basically get a higher level of subsidy. So mo and most po folks that use this generally don't buy it with one or two policies only. Uh, one or two products only. Um, and then again, there's that diversity. The premium rate lowers up to seven products, 
why it doesn't lower after <laughs> seven products, I have not yet figured out, but it, that's where it ends. And then essentially, so if you're more than seven products, you're not going to get a, a premium discount. And the premium discount is not uniform because it depends on the, the seven products you're growing. Because as you will see, certain products are more riskier than others. So you can't uniformly have a discounted, a discounted premium rate if the crops you're growing are, are more risky than others. Therefore, you, it's no one simple thing, but there is a measurable decrease in the premium as you add products, as you logically would think so, because the highly and more diverse a farm, the more you don't have all eggs in one basket and their risk is lower, therefore the premium is lower. This other, it also tracks, and, it, it, and this is the only crop insurance policy and I'm, we've been trying for several years to get this removed from the policy condition, but it requires that you not only track your, you have to track your historic expenses. And when you go to your insurance year, if you do not meet 70% of your historic average expenses in the year of insurance, you will get penalized and you won't get your full payment. Um, no other crop insurance policy does this in the country. And I have yet to figure out and got a straight answer as to why that is required. It also requires additional paperwork, which is another criticism of this policy. There's a new micro policy that was just announced literally two weeks ago, and we do not know the difference, and it's going to be an addendum to this policy. So it's basically a full farm revenue with a micro version and it's going to be limited to direct marketers and those who have $120,000 to 125, depending on whether you've had whole farm before. And again, there's no details on this. We do know that it's going to eliminate the expense requirement. So that, that is a good thing. I wish they would have made this addendum applicable to the whole policy, but they've only limited it now to the micro policy. They're going to get rid of this expense penalty. And I think that will, in, in some sense, make at least for those folks that are in that category, a little easier to make the application. Um, it's actually been one cool thing about whole farm revenue in a recent um, USD action plan for climate adaptation, which is the reason for we're having insurance issues these days, um, is that they noted, it's only insurance policy they noted that was the great, it was a great insurance policy because farmers use crop diversification to reduce risk. It's motivated to do that. So that's a great thing. Unfortunately, in, in, in 2021, only 1900 policies. So while it's a great thing because it incentivizes diversification, it's only applicable to 1900 policies. So we're not having much of a climate impact there, or, but at least it's, it's heading in the right direction, I think. Um, now with livestock, things get a bit. So I'm gonna do an example that's purely livestock. The only products being grown are livestock, very much like Jeremy's. This is not Jeremy's farm. So, so, and maybe Jeremy would like it to be his farm because it's, it's, it makes pretty good gross revenue, but, but, <laughs> but it is based on the kind of the things that, that Jeremy could or other people like him could be growing. And the one thing that, that and when we get to questions, um, I'm going to, you know, maybe Jerry can pipe, Jer Jeremy can pipe in here because I think one of the limitations that I found with, with applying whole farm to only a livestock farm, which is possible to do, it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter the products you grow, it's possible to do. When I look at the conditions of loss, these are the, in the policy, these are the things that you can claim, you know, hurt your production. If you look at those, most of those, have to do with crops, right? It's almost set up to be like crops. I mean, a volcanic eruption in Hawaii, if you're raising cows and the lava or the ash came down, it could kill your cows. So that could be, you know, volcanic eruption in Hawaii. And there are cattle farms in Hawaii, I've been to them. And earthquakes, I suppose, could kill some cows. Um, animal disease, um, again, but again, you know, the little proviso there, you know, if you didn't, you know, you took care of things, but then you still had a, a loss. You know, let's say um, Jeremy was saying about getting pneumonia when there was a thing, you know, when there was too cold, that animals could develop pneumonia and they, you had some death. That would be a 
under a livestock whole farm, that would be a legitimate cause of loss. But I think the most important one, of course, is the decline in price. The revenue aspect of, of the policy would be the one that would probably be most likely to be cause of loss for um, um, livestock. Maybe irrigation. And you can kind of see how they could or not, but, but um, I suppose a fire could kill your cows too. So in some ways you can see it's kind of set up for crops, but in other ways it, it potentially could apply. To, to, to livestock as well. So what does it cost? And it really does. That first thing is very important. I'm gonna give you an example and I'll point out why this is important. It, it essentially looks at your history and it looks what you expect to ensure the value of what you, the whole farm's revenue in the year of insurance, what you expect, and then what your history has been. And it looks at both of those sides of the equation and determines a revenue guarantee, okay? So if you have a highly variable history, your kind of average is going to be, you know, a little bit lower than maybe your expectation in the year of insurance. And since there's a difference there, this might make it, um, if, you're, if you have less variable, for instance, and your history was very close to your current thing, you might then be see that the cover, and it always uses a lower. I'll get into these details, but it really does depend on the variability of your historical revenue. And your variability kind of does show you how relatively risk you are, risky you are in terms of revenue. If you have highly variable revenue, then you can see that the things you're growing um, can, are influenced greatly by all kinds of different risks that affect revenue. And again, how different you're expected is in the year. I was kind of explaining that. Depends on how many products you produce, more is less. So in other words, again, up to that seven, you get, you know, it could cost less. Depends on, and it depends on the crops of those seven, those, those products that you grow, those seven you grow, risk the relative riskiness of them. Depends on the relative expected value of what you produce. So that's important. So let's say you have five different products and two of them, actually perform better than you expected and two, three of them worse, but overall the revenue is pretty much stable, then you're not likely to get a, a policy because it's not about the individual policies, it's about the whole farm's revenue. Now, if all five crash, of course, you're gonna get a, uh, you know, gonna get a payout. And if all five go up higher than you expect, you're not gonna get a payout. But in a way that's good. I mean, you don't want, you got house insurance, but you really don't want your house to burn down, right? <laughs> So, so you, you know, you, you know, you should be thankful that you paid and didn't have to use your insurance and didn't have to pay, but, but it is a cost. So you keep thinking, well, should I take the risk of buying? And that's up to the person. Um, it's usually always less expensive than the individual's policies uh, provided separately if they're available. Many places in the United States, you can't get insurance for in, in, for instance, the fresh market tomatoes that you can insure in, 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 um, in um, Arkansas, that policy is not available in every county in Arkansas. So you might not be able to get it and you could use Whole Farm to do that. But if you were to buy and they were all available, individual policies, uh, revenue policies in particular for each individual one, I almost can guarantee that the likelihood is buying them all separately it's going to cost more than buying a whole umbrella whole farm revenue policy. The interesting thing with, with this policy is you can buy a whole farm revenue policy and individual policies simultaneously. You can mix and match them and then one will pay out before the other. And, and farms in Montana have actually been around the country I've seen have done that. Okay, to the example, are we doing in time? Okay, um, what does it cost? now? Here I have, um, um, this, is, this is not Jeremy's farm. <laughs> um, uh, maybe Jeremy wouldn't even like it to be his farm, but anyway, his ranch. But uh, let's say this is the history of revenue. This is, their, this is from the tax forms. You just collect the data. And so you can see um, the original history is quite variable. You know, it was a really bad year in 2016 and in 2019, and there was a pretty good year in 2017. Um, now, here's what's complicated, again, already, with whole farm revenue. Um, and 
we kind of, well, we didn't ask for this, but it, it really does help. This essentially is a way to smooth out the variability of a revenue. So when you go to an agent, you have to have to, have to run this several different ways. First of all, there's called a 60% replacement. And basically you take 60% of this original history average and you plug it in for those places that were below that 60% uh, number, which of course, what? Raises your average up a bit. This is 44, you know, 800, this is 45. Another thing, another option is to throw out the worst year and then divide by four instead of uh, five. And you can see that that's, um, in this case, it's not always the same, you know, so that's why you have to run all the scenarios. It would depend on what the original history was. You can see that the av this, this smoothed out average is now higher. There's one more option and it's called 90% of a previous whole farm revenue guarantee. So last year, this guy, let's just say had 47,000 whole farm revenue guarantee. That would mean he could also use this 42,300, but that's worse than all these three other options in terms of giving the uh, guaranteed value for insurance. So we're gonna go with the lowest year in this case. But you can see that's a bit complicated. You have to run three scenarios and your agents should know how to do this. And they do know how to do this. And I can do it too. I mean, there's actually a cost estimator on the, whole, on the RMA website. And if you learn how to do it, it's not too bad. So you could calculate it. So this is what the farmer's ranch is gonna expect in 2021. And I made everything organic because I'm a very strong promoter of organic agriculture and grass finished beef. So <laughs> these prices are, reasonable, I think. I don't know if they're accurate. Um, I mean, I don't know if they were the actual prices available, but these were determined to be, you know, from history and what was expected, what one could get from these. And you can see that these are all, well, they're all livestock products. Honey is insects, the product of insects, right? <laughs> so we've got all livestock things. We have the value and we have a total gross revenue. All right. This is what we expect. This is the value, that, you know, if we could have 100% with no, you know, no um, deductible, we would like to insure $65,000. And so if there's any loss, revenue or yield related, I want compensation, right? But it doesn't work that way. What it does is you take the best number you got from looking at the history and you look at what you expected and the insurance guarantee is based on the lower of the two. Now you could say, well, that's, in this case, you know, it, 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 it might be serious as to whether you'd want to take this insurance out. But from the perspective of RMA and the insurance companies, think about this. It looks like, it looks like at the best, even if we smooth out your variability, your, your historic capacity of this farm seems to be roughly around $50,000. That's what you can kind of, you know, look at, looking at history, you can expect to get. Now, true, you think this year, 65,000, you know, because, you know, the prices are better and blah, blah, blah. I, you know, that's what you really think you can do. And you can notice there's quite a bit of difference between those two. So the guarantee though, however, is only going to be in that lower one. So right there, you might say, well, heck, you know, think about it in terms of cars, you know. Um, I think I'm driving a Porsche, but the car, the car insurance person says, no, you're more like a Ford, you know? <laughs> and you say, but no, I'm a Porsche, you know? And I want the value of the Porsche covered. And they say, well, you really don't have a Porsche. I mean, that's kind of a silly analogy, but the point is they're saying, we're only gonna give you that guarantee. And then, because there's always a deductible and the maximum amount of, coverage is 85% so is, is in what I'm doing. So I'm gonna take the maximum coverage. That means my revenue guarantee is this 42,288, which is significantly different from 65,000. Again, right there, you might say, no way. And I call that the trigger point because, because that's when you have to have a loss down to 42,028 before you see a dime from, from a payment, from a, from a loss payment. So you have to, you can have quite a bit of loss before you, the insurance even kicks in, is triggered. And so you have to have that $22,712 worth of loss before you get anything.
Now, what does it cost? The total premium is almost $7,000. The producer only has to pay $3,070 and taxpayers and the government, taxpayers really, <laughs> pay the subsidy. That, so crop insurance, and this is true of all crop insurance and livestock insurance in this case, is that there's significant public subsidization of the premium cost, the actual determined actual premium cost. So there's the numbers. There's what you see, your choice. If you want it, go to your agent, have them run the numbers. And remember that this difference between your history and what your expectations are can be significant and may be the reason you don't want to buy it. Again, I'm not here to sell insurance. I'm just telling you how it works. If these numbers were really close together, that might make you incentivize you more to, or think about it more because you would actually be covering that portion instead of that forward. There's some other fine print things and there's always fine print with insurance of all types. Um, the reporting requirements, the validation of your tax, you know, all, all of this can be very onerous. And in fact, it's in my opinion, and the opinion of many others have been working on this for years. It's onerous and I think redundant and could be improved. Um, livestock provides a particularly kind of complication because you have to do an inventory. In other words, you know, feeder calves and you, know, you have these calves that are born. If you keep some of them, you're only in you, and you have your, your original herd, you know, the valuation, you have to work through what did you actually sell and the value of what you said minus the inventory, you know, as a bookkeeping thing, again, the agent and yourself. But if you're not taking really good financial records, that can be an extra burden. Um, and the insurance company via the agent can ask for even more required for creation. And I'm putting this here, if they have reasons the policy handbook for this policy says that the company and the agents can ask for more information, but they have to have legitimate reasons to go. So for instance, if you have your tax forms and they're all there and you give them to them and they say, well, we want more. We want, we want to know why in 2015 you said you're da 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 and give us your sales records. Theoretically, they could ask for those. They don't have to. And if they do, they have to have reasons for doing so. And I would, if I was a person and I was serious and wanted to buy it, I would ask them as to why. And I've asked the RMA and others about this and I'd be curious as to what the reasons they would be given. So if you ever do it and they give you reasons, call me up and send me an email, let me know what the reasons why they required more validation than the enormous amount of validation that's required already. And again, this micro is coming. It's supposed to be less paperwork, and but it's limited to farms that are, are, are smaller in terms of gross revenue. Um, if you want to buy it this year, um, depends on when you file your taxes. Some people don't use standard um, calendar year tax uh, payments. They use different fiscal years. And so there's a little bit of weirdness there, but um, January 31st, um, it can vary. But in I looked in Arkansas and every county in Arkansas, if you want to buy this policy this coming for this coming year, 228 is the date of sales closing date. It means you have to buy the policy. Um, um, and if you're this fiscal, late fiscal filer, you actually have to do it more, more quickly than that. And um, I don't know, I don't know. This is a nice link. You can. This is going to be recorded. Um, you can really just Google the RMA. Just go RMA and Google, and you'll see on the very top. I'll show you a picture of that. You can find an agent if you haven't used a crop insurance agent before. It'll give you a great. It's actually in. It's in Spanish anyway. I think so. There's different language. Anyway, you can. It, it gives you a really. It's a pretty cool thing. A tool that will find um, all the different age, crop insurance agents around you, uh, in your state and county. Um, and this is, I mean, it's just my advice, but shop around. Um, I know in the history of Montana, we're, you know, we're very small, we're, very, we're a very large state with about a lot, few people. And a lot of people have to have different, many jobs besides farming and ranching. And so a lot of them will do, um, become crop insurance agents as a secondary job. And, and I always think it's interesting because a lot of times people will be going to their cousins or their brother or somebody to be their crop insurance agent. And there's nothing matter with that. 
but but he makes sure that you trust your cousin and your agent. They're going to do the best job for you. Um, you know, it's it's like anything else. There, you know, there are better ones and worse ones. And particularly when you get the whole farm revenue or some of the more obscure policies, make sure the person both wants to sell the policy, you know, and knows seems to know something about it, seems to know about the kinds of things you produce. You know, uh, and make sure they're going to, you know, we have found with whole farm revenue, for instance, that um, some agents just don't like to sell it because it's it's a little bit more complex than just buying a corn policy. And so they, you know, they don't want to bother. They've got other people, you know, but, you know, you know, they have to sell it. If they, if they sell federal crop insurance programs, they're obligated to provide you a quote, they're obligated to sell it to if you still want to buy it after the quote. But again, you don't want to work with somebody who's not, you know, interested in helping you and making it work for you. So again, um, sometimes there are options besides um, whole farm revenue because you, you know, maybe you're fresh market tomatoes or your eggs are doing well. Eggs, there's no alternative. But let's say you know you have some alternatives. You might want to buy that that a single policy for that revenue policies for single crop. Crops are fairly good if they're available. But if you grow lavender, for instance, there's nothing available. So whole farm is your only alternative. Um, and this whole thing about how variable your gross revenue in for the last five or three years, depending on a beginning farmer, um, the degree of variability, even though we saw that we have smoothed out that variability by using those different 60% or replacement or 90% of last year's whole farm guarantee, you know, you have these other options that will kind of smooth that variability out. That variability still may be greater than what you expect to, to generate in the year of insurance. So that in itself, so that may or may not make it interesting to you. Uh, I really do think I've been trying with other folks uh, from a federal policy point of view, to make this much less burdensome to apply. Um, and again, they, they need, legally must, but again, don't want to work with someone who doesn't really want to, to sell it to you. And unfortunately, we have fairly good evidence. We actually did a national survey of crop insurance agents, and I'd say it was half and half. Many of them hated the policy, didn't want to sell it, thought it was terrible, and others saw it as a new option for for a new set of clients that they could serve. Um, if you have seven or less products, there's this discount. Um, and I think the more and more crops you have to account for and the higher level of diversity, um, the more onerous this, again, this paperwork becomes and perhaps that makes it more difficult to even bother to buy it. Um, and we have also found that <laughs> the more highly diverse forms tend to fail that their diversity by itself provides the, their, their insurance and therefore they don't need it. And particularly if it's burdensome, they, they tend not to buy it. So we actually finding that the people that actually buy whole farm revenue are not the highly highest diversified farms in the country, although they're probably more diversified than your average like corn and soybean farmer in the Midwest. Um, contracted products can help with the application because one of the things you have to do is establish the expected price. And if you haven't been growing it before, that can be problematic and you want the value to be actually close to the value that you expect to get. Um, and that can, and the value added product whole thing, taking out that can also complicate things. Here's the um, RM website, the first homepage. And right here, you see the find an agent. That was that I was gonna show you how it worked. There's also um, these tools which include uh, ways of looking at um, and actually estimating a cost of a policy. It's a bit more complicated. Maybe in a future seminar, I can teach people how to use that tool so they can find out for themselves without going for an agent, roughly how much a policy would cost. And with that, I'll show you some wonderful lambs from I think my neighbor in Montana. And um, uh, that's my contact information. We have a lot of links. If you go to the ATRA website, you go to the crop insurance risk management uh, major section, a whole bunch of all these, these are some of the uh, documents in there. Fortunately, some of them are getting old already. It's really hard to keep them updated, but a lot of them are, 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 are fairly updated and 
um, I'm proud of a lot. I think all of those I wrote and are were part of, uh, and, um, and I think they're good, good, good information. And with that, I will go back to questions and thank you. All right. Anyone have any questions? Feel free to speak or put them in the chat. Don't be shy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jeremy, what do you think? You know, you, you never said you looked into insurance or whole farm. And now what do you think? <laughs> yeah, really impressed with, uh, with a lot of that. The whole farm for us would be really appropriate, as well as the um, I forget the proper name for it. But the rainfall one is interesting because we're starting to see these weather patterns shifting from what we're used to. Um, you know, I can see some circumstances in the last few years that the rainfall one would have been a very interesting one to look at. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that. I'm a little depressed that like our local FSA and RCS folks aren't pushing this more because this was all new information for me. Um, yeah. You'd think that the advertising from the government would be a little bit better for some of this. Um, at least I'm sure like the big row crop folks are well aware of it. Their bankers probably uh, make them be more aware of it. But like yes. for... <laughs> Yeah. Well, you're exactly exactly right on that one jeremy yeah. i mean if you have a if you have a loan you have to have insurance in many cases and so right. they they go find the insurance after they need the loan and, and that's right. not necessarily the best reason rma is is also an agency that unlike fsa and nrcs um you know they they um don't have the same bandwidth or staffing honestly to be able to promote their programs as much as you know they could so you know, to give it some some fairness to them um but yes the forage index is very interesting one and i was glad to do that for this thing because i'm getting involved in that out here in the southwest and in the in the in the northern great plains because we're having really severe droughts year back to year almost and it's becoming a policy that's being used more and you'll note it's a policy used uh, i should have shown you a map it's a policy used all over the country now and and there was significant use of it in arkansas so, yeah. so some folks have already seen an advantage. It's, it's a whole nother topic to give you a talk on it because there's, there's even research on it. It's very tricky. You, you have to pick certain months to insure. And, right. and then you have to look at your history of where rainfall is in your pattern and try to optimize your likelihood of, of, of seeing the drought occur in, that, in those months. So it's kind of like, it feels like, feels like a casino to me a little bit when, you, when you're doing this. But if you have good data and you have a good agent and you have some knowledge of, of your own place and the history of rainfall, you know, mm -hmm. you can optimize that. And, and there actually are people working on how to optimize um, that policy for a, gi a given person. And I said, it's becoming incredibly used nationwide as we get into these extreme weather events and, and, and years of alternate drought and not drought and, right. and that kind of thing. So yeah, anyway, thanks for that. Um, yeah. Keep going if you have other questions. Any other questions? <laughs> I was just gonna comment on that, on just on that one piece. Um, for us, uh, the like you can model the climate and whatnot, you can sort of gamble on it. But I know just on, because I keep, pretty ridiculous records on almost everything on the farm but i know when um i, I would I, I can pretty well tell which months i would um ensure um uh, because i know how long it takes like the impact of that rain or not rain um to show an effect on my production um so i can say like well if i don't have rain by you know say august 15th um i'll i'll ensure august and september because i know i'll be in trouble in december because of that lack of rain in those months um but anyway, it's just that's an interesting, interesting yeah. one. And the, inter the interesting thing about the interview, and it's not some inter the inter the 17 by 17 miles square. Now, that's not a big deal with a small, relatively small place, because everything that happens within it, that grid is is what what determines whether you get paid or not. Really, that's all that determines whether you get paid or not is is a formula. That's why it's called an index. It's based on a rainfall. And that index hits a certain point you get paid or not, even if you didn't have actually demonstrable losses. Right. Uh, you would still right. get paid. However, if that whole grid does not hit that point and you actually really had some losses on your place, you still wouldn't get paid. Yeah. Right. That's what's right. bizarre about it. It's not a determination of your actual loss. It's just right. an index triggered. <laughs> and so it's a, 
it's it's a very strange approach. It's actually used worldwide now, and it makes what one advantage of it from a public policy point of view and public cost point of view. It's very easy to determine loss. You don't have to have a, you know, an adjuster come out and you don't have right. to have people doing fraud or whatever. It hits or it doesn't hit. But right. the people that are in a grid and they doesn't hit and they still have loss, they aren't very happy campers. So right. they, yeah. they, they go, oh, it was horrible. It was horrible. And they say, well, and you're a little grid. Now, I suppose with technology, the grids will get smaller and smaller eventually. So that will be less of an issue. But at the point now, you know, there, there are some grumpy people sometimes when it doesn't kick in for them or they well, you, pick the wrong months. <laughs> right. Well, you could layer that with your whole farm insurance. Precisely. And then that, that would help it on that one circumstance where my one farm was the one that didn't get rain that year kind of video. So, yeah. And that is a beauty of whole farm revenue. It's one of the only ones where you can do the, you can mix and match them. Right. Okay. And well, it that- gets even more complicated then to explain and how the payments are made. But usually what happens is the, the first loss to the individual policy is paid out first, and then any remaining that might be left over, not paid by the individual policy that still then gets paid. So it, it is a weird way it works. And of course, the cost is going to be different because you're going to be paying for an individual and the right. whole farm. But right. again, people have done it in, in Montana on very large farms with high diversity. And these are big grain farms. They will they will pick two or three of the major and valuable crops, ensure them of the revenue protection. And then for all these little crops that are, there's no possible like spelt and, right. and ancient grains and, you know, they'll, there's no option. Then they will put a whole farm policy, like an umbrella over the whole thing. And that's okay. doable with this okay. program. Cool. Any more, thank you. Any more questions? Any more questions? Don't be intimidated right. by we, me. We got one. We got one. <laughs> Go ahead. I have a strange question. Yeah. uh, So I work on a nonprofit that has a unrelated business. And then it also has some farming, a a CSA organic crop garden and market garden and a small flock of meat sheep. So we don't file taxes at all. We're nonprofit. You have to have a schedule F to get this kind of insurance. Yeah. Or equivalent. So So it doesn't have to be a, no, it, it, what, I, it, it gets tricky there, you know, there's different ways and I, the nonprofit, you're, you know, I have to go look it up and I can get it back to you, but depending on the form of your, of how you pay tax now, nonprofits, I guess they don't even pay taxes at all. So there, and you don't, so you don't maybe file any kind of taxes, do you? Oh yeah. That, no. <laughs> that would probably, you're probably stuck then you're right. Um, okay. You might want to like branch that off and make it into a limited liability corporation and pay taxes and then you could use that tax record to do that but that might not that might be way more than you are you did mention csas and Mm -hmm. csas do present a particular problem for whole farm revenue um in part because you know the the way that i ran i started a csa you know it's a it's a membership fee you're not again purchasing individual crops so, oh, it, it, okay. and so, so, and usually CSAs, at least the one I run, you know, we had like 40 different kinds of things that we sold in our CSA in New Jersey mm-hmm. years ago. And yeah. I would hate to have to go and have the records to identify each one of those 40 crops and their revenue expected, you know, and their histories. Um, and, I, and, and actually, I don't remember filing taxes. I suppose we had to, but, but I wonder if how a CSA deals with um, sales, for instance, and filing a schedule after your CSA, that, that, that might right. impact it. Uh, although I'm pretty sure you'd still have the gross sales line. So, and it, you probably have to file some kind of, of uh, again, how the CSA was incorporated would matter. They have ways to take a different format, like a Schedule C or something, and, and fit it into an equivalent Schedule F. That can be done, and, and that's, that's been systematized. So, again, the agent can work okay. through that, and they'll put it in that format. And the bottom line of it is, between you and the agent and your records, and if they're tax records, they should be able to come up with that revenue guarantee. And that's really when you make the rubber hits the road, because if that revenue guarantee compared to what you think the farm's going to regenerate aren't copacetic, you know, why, why buy, you know, buy the insurance at all if it's not really going to cover the value you think needs to be covered? That's where it comes okay. down to it. So let them work through the details and say, okay, okay 
given what we know and the information we can do and fit it into an equivalent schedule, you know, that's your, that's likely to be a revenue and then you move forward from there. I mean, put the onus, of, you know, these agents are supposed to help you. They're getting well. Paid well. <laughs> Make them do it. <laughs> Make them do it. But they're going to need records and that's the problem. So you're still going to have to, that is a big burden for this policy is that um, to the degree you don't, I would say the more diverse you are and the less record keeping you have, <laughs> the harder it's going to be to get through the policy, even with a good agent who wants to help you. If you have less product and pretty good records, then it's going to be a lot easier for you. And if you look at the history that I showed you of them only being three or most four on average crops being insured, you can see mm -hmm. the tendency is the people that are using it or people that are diverse don't have all alternative options, want revenue protection, and you know are somewhere between zero and twelve you know products. You go way to the other side, not much revenue, high diversity, paperwork becomes cumbersome. You know, and then even on the other sides, people with three or four crops, but they can't get insurance with other with other insurance. Even three or four makes sense for them because they can't get revenue insurance any other way. So a CSA would not be considered a farm product. They would look at each individual vegetable in that you CSA. Still you still have to show okay. that you'd have to like come up with, even though you're paying a membership fee for whatever comes into the box, right? You would still have to go back and say, the value of these were X. It's interesting when I ran a CSA because I'm an economist and whatever. <laughs> I was so anal with my records that to sell CSA memberships, I, I listed every crop we grew. I went to the grocery store and priced it out and said, look, our share will give you all these crops at a value that's lesser than if you went and bought them at the grocery store. And actually did those numbers to pitch the idea of a CSA to someone, which was not mm -hmm. actually in the long run, it was not a really good way to pitch the CSA because you really should push the CSA that you're buying ownership in this farm, in my opinion. And then and then whatever we produce, you're gonna be happy with. But, but I wanted to try to show them that it was a pretty good deal. <laughs> so. But that could be really cumbersome. I, I would have been terribly cumbersome for a farm that we ran, which was like, like I say, 40 different kinds of things to track those all carefully, relatively carefully. Mm -hmm. We did a pretty good job just because I was anal you know, retentive. But other than that, I mean, not everybody does. So it is a burden for whole farm revenue when you get to be highly diverse to run through the paperwork. And you know, and, and they've made it harder by the stupid things like the, like having to account for expenses. It's it makes no sense. And yet, for many years, we've tried to get convinced the risk management agency, Congress, for that matter, to change that, but they don't. Now, the micro program is an attempt to change that, but again, that's been that's limited to a very small set of farms out there. And um, who probably aren't going to, I hate to say this, aren't going to use the insurance anyway, because they're highly diverse already, don't want paperwork in general. What I think small, highly diverse farms need and CSAs need is a simplified catastrophic policy. The diversity kind of protects them, but what they don't protect it as is, is the giant storm, the flood, you know, across the river, you know, the thing that will really wipe them out. And that's called a catastrophic policy. And they're relatively cheap because those things are, don't happen to that degree. They don't usually cover as much. But my whole point too about insurance is, you know, thinking about, if I think about it, it's like, how can I keep farming? How can I keep ranching? I don't want something to come and destroy my ability to keep farming because this is that's what really is important to me is to keep going. And to the degree that insurance will keep me financially solvent enough to keep farming, then I think it makes sense. And to the degree things are changing, which is happening, extreme weather events and things, then insurance becomes more. I'll give you a good example. There was a polar vortex we were talking about and that hit came down and I've been looking at the numbers of that destruction in Texas. There was one whole farm revenue policy sold in Texas last this year. And then the polar vortex hit, that farm probably maybe saved itself from going completely out of business. But there were thousands of farms that could have had whole farm revenue policies because there wasn't no an alternative for other individual policies for them to have. So what are they? They're dependent on disaster payments and or they're gone. 
So that disappoints me that there was this option. But again, it's like your house, you know, you got to buy insurance because you have a mortgage, blah, blah, blah. And you, you know, you, you, the probability of house burning down is really small. Yet, <laughs> I pay $150 a month in, in house insurance, whether I, and I practically own my house, but I still do it. Why? Because it's one of the most valuable assets I have. And if it does burn down, which it actually in Montana right now, we have more fires and more fires, is, although I protected my house. Anyway, the point is, you know, it's, we're entering some times, I think, where, where these are going to be, there's going to be some serious issues. And I think it's a combination of the insurance to help people survive. And then it's to really work on adaptation. It's to really look at where are we headed? What can I grow? How can I organize like what Jeremy was? How can I organize ways to limit these extremities that are, are going to occur more and more? What, what product, different products will I grow? How will I grow them differently? Um, those are between the insurance to help you get to the point where you can make those adaptive changes is critical, but making those adaptive changes is also critical. And there are any more questions that come up, you know, we, we're always open to talk. Or you can email Jeff or myself. Uh, you could email me. I work with lots of people. Yeah. yeah and if you, if you go out and try to buy this or anybody who experiences, I, Love to hear experiences that people have with their agents and, uh, you know, and uh, or, you know, issues and problems, because that makes me, uh, you know, understand how it's working or not working for people. And that's been, a, like I say, a 19 year mission to to, to, to work through. So, so um, I'm well, always Jeff, learning stuff. I've been trying to get agents to get on the on the, on the call on the yeah. uh, Zoom, uh, Jeff. I just can't get them to. Yeah, well, that might, get on. you know, that might be a, some data by itself. What does that indicate? <laughs> that could indicate they're busy or it could indicate they don't want to go there. <laughs> it could. It could. I shouldn't say that. I don't know. I don't know. But, but um, you know, it's, again, it's not a, there are not a lot of policies sold. I, I think it's a little bit blind of the agents and the and the and even the AIPs, the the, the big companies. Um, they don't see this as a, you know, at one level, if they fix it a little bit, it, it it could service a whole hell of a lot of farmers and ranchers out there that aren't getting insurance now. And and if you were thinking, if you're in business, right? <laughs> well, how do you make more crop insurance business? You have more clients, right? right? And if you have a new, and if you're young and you have this new area of potential clients that could use insurance, you would think that would be a way to go. But uh, frankly, I think it's because they, there's this uh, idea, you know, which is true, is they made it ever remember more, more complicated it just becomes one of these things where, oh, I don't want to get into that. You know, it's too hard. It's too much work. Um, you know, everybody tells me, and, and they're scared that they'll write up the policy wrong. I can understand the other side of, of the question too. But, you know, with tools and things that we have these days, I mean, think about, I do taxes with TurboTax. TurboTax is the most amazing tool I've ever seen for doing taxes. You know, I mean, it's like just leads you along, you answer the questions, boom, you're done. And, generates wonderful forms. You could do the same thing. In fact, we created a tool years ago that was kind of based on TurboTax idea to help people process the whole farm revenue or AGR Lite in those cases. It was called the AGR Wizard. It was a really cool project. I still would like to do that. I think um, this could be automate, you know, could, could be systematized in a way that should be able to make it easy for the, the agent to write a policy up correctly. If, again, if somebody had the entrepreneurial venture, you know, to want to see this as a, a good business opportunity as a crop insurance agent and uh, learn and, and service the folks that, that do need this insurance, I think, and will need it more in the future, unfortunately. Thanks, everybody. everybody. All right. Thanks, thank Jeremy. You. Thank you nice all. seeing your operation finally, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye. Have a good afternoon, everyone. All right.